Hello and a very warm welcome to the first in a new series of podcasts in association with Kumar and Clark's Clinical Medicine, published by Elsevier. In this podcast, I'm going to be talking about multiple sclerosis. Specifically, I want to talk about some definitions for multiple sclerosis, the most important epidemiology, etiology and some of the pathogenesis of the disease, and then finally go through the most important clinical features, investigations, and consider some of the treatment modalities that are available. So multiple sclerosis is a chronic inflammatory condition of the central nervous system. The characteristic features of this inflammation are multiple areas or plaques of demyelination, affecting both the brain and the spinal cord. Multiple sclerosis used to be known as disseminated sclerosis because we find that these areas of demyelination or plaques are disseminated both in where they occur, therefore in place, and also when they occur, therefore in time. In the United Kingdom, multiple sclerosis has an incidence of roughly 6 per 100,000, and it tends to be a disease of young adults, with the most common ages of presentation between 20 and 45. Importantly, it is more common in women than men. Interestingly, the prevalence of multiple sclerosis increases directly in proportion with the distance away from the equator. The exact pathogenesis of multiple sclerosis is quite poorly understood. However, it is thought that there is an immune-mediated attack on myelin, leading to um, areas of inflammation known as plaques and associated demyelination. The etiology of the disease is also fairly poorly understood. However, both a genetic predisposition and various infections have been proposed as risk factors. For example, between monozygotic twins, there is a 31% concordance. And in addition, multiple sclerosis is associated with certain HLA types, such as HLA-A3 and B7. Although multiple infections, including measles, scrapie, and the human T-cell leukemia virus, have all been proposed as potential infective primers for multiple sclerosis, no link um, has actually been found between the conditions. As already mentioned, the key pathological feature in multiple sclerosis is the presence of multiple plaques of demyelination. Importantly, these plaques tend to occur at specific sites, and these sites correspond with the various clinical manifestations of the disease. The sites that are important are the optic nerves, the brainstem and its cerebellar connections, and finally the cervical spinal cord, particularly the posterior columns and spinothalamic tracts. The presentation of multiple sclerosis tends to follow one of three patterns. The most common pattern is the relapsing remitting pattern that 80% of patients with multiple sclerosis will present with. In this form of the disease, there are multiple episodes, short episodes often, of neurological uh, disability followed by complete or partial recovery. Often these patients then go on to develop secondary progressive disease where their neurological disability becomes more severe with each occurring attack. There are two other forms of the disease to be aware of. These are primary progressive where patients present with neurological disability and then do not recover and have a gradual deterioration. There is also a fulminant form of the disease which tends to run its course over a number of months. So as already mentioned, the plaques in multiple sclerosis tend to occur at three specific sites. These are the optic nerves, the brainstem and its cerebellar connections, and the cervical spinal cord. 
What I want to do now is talk about how these plaques at these different sites tend to present clinically. So the first site that can be affected is the optic nerves. Now this tends to occur in a asymmetrical fashion, so one optic nerve tends to be affected to a greater degree than the other. Patients usually describe onset of blurring of vision over hours or, or days, and they tend to describe this as looking through frosted glass. There may also be mild ocular pain associated with the impaired visual acuity. In terms of the signs, sometimes there can be no signs present at all, and this tends to occur most often when the optic neuropathy is retrobulbar behind the optic disc. If the optic disc is affected, then swelling of the disc may be seen. Many patients with optic neuropathy will also have a relative afferent pupillary defect. Most patients have complete recovery from their episode within about two months. In patients presenting with brainstem demyelination, the most common um, features are diplopia, vertigo, either with or without nystagmus, and pseudobulbar palsy, which may manifest as dysarthria or dysphagia. The most common cranial nerve to be affected with diplopia is the sixth cranial nerve or abducens nerve. Patients may also have an intranuclear ophthalmoplegia. The last presentation corresponds with a lesion in the cervical spinal cord. Patients here will present with the progressive onset of difficulty in walking and numbness. They may also describe the sensation of electric shocks in their limbs and these can be reproduced on examination through flexing the neck. This is known as Lermit's sign. On examination of their lower limbs, they will have a spastic parapesis, and sensory examination may reveal patchy sensory loss. In the patient with end-stage multiple sclerosis, there will often be a wide array of features corresponding with lesions in all of the already mentioned typical sites. So patients will have spastic tetrapesis, ataxia and nystagmus reflecting brainstem and cerebellar involvement, urinary incontinence, as well as pseudobulbar palsy. They also tend to develop dementia. Death in multiple sclerosis tends to result from uremia, often with bronchopneumonia. So let's move on now to talk about the most important investigations for the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. I guess the first thing to say is that the diagnosis of multiple sclerosis is actually quite difficult as some patients will present with one of the um, aforementioned uh, clinical syndromes um, which will completely resolve and then they may go in remission for many many years before having a further episode. In addition, some patients who have a few episodes may not go on to develop secondary progressive disease. However, the most definitive diagnostic test for multiple sclerosis is MRI of the brain and spinal cord. And 85% of patients with clinical disease will have lesions present. The most common sites to see lesions are in the periventricular white matter, the brainstem and the cervical spinal cord. Other diagnostic tests include a lumbar puncture with CSF showing characteristic oligoclonal IgG bands and a raised cell count. In addition, electrophysiological tests can be used particularly in the setting of optic neuropathy and will show delayed visual evoked responses. It's important to note that peripheral nerve studies and the EEG are largely unhelpful. 
So finally, let's talk about the management of the patient with multiple sclerosis. Management of multiple sclerosis is particularly challenging, and this is firstly because there are very few therapies that can be offered to, to patients with severe disease, and also because it's very difficult to predict the severity at presentation of the disease. However, there are two important drug therapies or two situations in which drug therapies have been shown to be effective. The first of these is in the context of acute relapses of multiple sclerosis. Here it's been shown that a short course, perhaps three days, of intravenous methylprednisolone may reduce the severity of an attack. It does not, however, reduce the outcome in that patient. The second drug therapy is subcutaneous beta interferon. This has been shown to reduce the relapse rate. However, just like with the methylprednisolone, long-term outcome is unaffected. However, it has been shown that there are a reduced number of lesions present on MRI with beta interferon therapy. Also important to be aware that this is a particularly expensive drug. In patients with chronic disabling multiple sclerosis, a rehabilitative approach should be taken. Often this involves involving multiple members of the multidisciplinary team. Patients can be given significant support in their lives through giving them walking aids, wheelchairs, through converting cars, and also through performing various alterations in their home. Infections, particularly urinary tract infections, should be treated promptly as these worsen the severity of their disease. Urinary incontinence may be helped by oxybutynin together with intermittent self-catheterization. Spasticity, which is a particular feature of end-stage multiple sclerosis, can be alleviated through the use of physiotherapy and muscle relaxants such as baclofen. Many patients also use cannabis for painful spasms and cannabis extracts such as sativa are currently being evaluated. So, multiple sclerosis is a demyelinating condition of the brain and the spinal cord. The key pathological feature of the disease is the plaque, and these tend to be disseminated both in time and space. The most common sites that are affected by plaques are the optic nerves, brainstem and spinal cord and this broadly corresponds with the various presentations of the disease. The MRI is particularly useful in showing plaques and 85% of patients with clinical disease will have evidence of plaques, particularly in the perivenular areas. In managing the patient with multiple sclerosis or indeed potential multiple sclerosis, it's important to take a multidisciplinary approach and to provide them with significant education and support. For acute episodes, short courses of intravenous steroids can be used and in some patients, interferon beta can be used to reduce relapse rate. So that completes this podcast. Thanks for listening. Watch out for more podcasts in association with Kumar and Clark's Clinical Medicine. If you want to find out more about this book and other books that are produced by Elsevier, check out the Elsevier website or studentconsult.com. So thanks for listening and see you all soon.